So yeah, welcome to this talk. And uh, I would like to thank my employer, G-Solutions, for offering me the possibility to be here today. Uh, G-Solutions is a company based in Italy with offices in the United States and soon in Dubai. Um, we support open source projects and we are actually core developers uh, of uh, each one of them. So you can contact us in uh, any uh, anytime you, you need something fixed or a new feature developed that you really need to get into, into the project. Uh, we uh, strongly believe in, in open source. We are part of OSGEO. We participate in OGC and so on. So let's talk about uh, publishing raster data. So let's say you have a, a ton of it. Uh, and as you see from uh, the previous presentation, there is a lot of sources right now uh, of uh, uh, raster data at high uh, frequency co of collection. Uh, how do you, first of all, locate that? Well, in terms of protocols, right now, the, the most common protocol to catalog and search for um, satellite data in general or meteorological prediction or whatever has a space and a time component is STACK. STACK stands for uh, Spatial Temporal Asset Catalog. It's a RESTful API, reminiscent, actually compatible with uh, OGC API features which collects uh, all your products and organizes it in collections. So the idea is that you have a collection, which is a uniform set of uh, satellite data uh, products. You have the products inside, the items, and each item has a bunch of typically files, which are call called assets. So take the, the classic Sentinel-2 uh, data set. It's a set of 13 files plus a bunch, one per band plus a bunch of metadata files, each one of them would be an asset. And in GeoServer, you can search for the collections, you can search for the products, and you can even use the assets as they are to build an image mosaic. So uh, this is a screenshot from the German Space Agency uh, EOC service, which is based on GeoServer stack implementation. Uh, the stack uh, representation of resources in HTML in GeoServer is customizable through templates, and this is what they did for theirs. So this is the landing page where you can find all the entry points for the API. This is the set of collections. They customize the representation of the, uh, each collection with a, with a browse image with uh, a bunch of properties and keywords and so on. Uh, this is the representation of one single collection. And here there is a list of items, so products inside the collection. Each one of them is a, is a satellite take. And uh, when you look into one particular uh, product, you can see all the assets and uh, a browse image and so on. And uh, this is, as I said, all customized. I've shown you the customization of HTML, but each of these resources is also represented as a JSON resource for machine-to-machine -machine communication. And uh, the JSON resource can be customized just the same through template mechanisms. In addition to that, in parallel, we also have open search for you, which is an older specification to do exactly the same, again, from OGC. It was based on RSS rather than uh, GeoJSON. And well, it provides more or less the same principles and uh, uh, functionality. So that's one example of a search. The search is for anything in Sentinel-2 that has a cloud cover of less than 30%. And the output is typically RSS. Uh, backing those two projects, sorry, those two services, we have a, a, an administration REST API that can be used to ingest more data, allocate layers out of collections, uh, create image mosaics and the like. So full automation of the data management. Okay, say that you decided what you, what you would like to, to, to use or see. Uh, how do you access raster data? Well, um, uh, the, the single assets can be located anywhere on the file system, on the network, but also on S3 through the, the, the COC plugin. Uh, if you are using cloud-optimized GeoTIFF, you, uh, you can store them in S3, Azure, Google, or whatever HTTP server. But all the same, you can put them uh, on, a, on a local file system or a network file system. Uh, the COC plugin takes full advantage of the optimized structure of the cloud-optimized geotiffs to reduce the amount of, amount of data transfer and only pick the data that it needs out of the uh, data source. Okay, so GeoServer is thus able to access the assets. How do we have a look at them, mosaicing them, typically? 
So in GeoServer, we have the concept of mosaic. The mosaic is based on, a, on an index, which can be see, imagined as a table having uh, a footprint of the file, a location of where the file is, and then a set of alphanumeric in, uh, information like time, cloud covers, no cover, uh, whatever information might be attached to it. And all this information can be used for filtering, sorting, and then eventually locating the data and rendering it. Uh, the elements of a mosaic are called granules, the single files, and uh, we have complete freedom over them. They can overlap as they please. They don't have to be uh, nicely aligned. They can be in different file formats. They can be in different projections. And within reason, they can be in different color models, like I can mix together in the same image, grayscale and RGB, for example. Um, as I said, the table mosaic index uh, can be is, is our filtering and lookup mechanism. It can be located in uh, a number of actual data sources, like relational databases, but it can also be another stack API, so a remote stack API. I'll have a slide about it later. And uh, if you don't like what we have, there's a plugin mechanism. You can write your own image mosaic index data source of your own, maybe to connect to a, a, an in-house catalog that you already have without having to duplicate the data. Uh, as I said, many of the attributes are used for uh, search, and in particular, time and elevation are well-known uh, search parameters in the WMS and WMTS protocol, and uh, you can use them to uh, quickly locate the data uh, at a particular point in time. Uh, and uh, any other attribute can be used as a custom dimension. So you want to filter by wavelength, for example, or by runtime if you are talking about a weather forecast, like when you did run the prediction. Uh, that's another possibility. We can use the internal stack API as an index for the mosaic. So think about your collection, that it has many products inside. They are typically all uniform. We can take that search index and use it as the index for an image mosaic. So I can literally ask your server, make me an image mosaic out of that collection, or make me an image mosaic out of a portion of that collection. I could choose subparts of the collection to build uh, a, a layer that I can then publish through WMS and WMTS. If I don't like the internal one, well, I can go to an external one. Let's say that I have a stack API which is remote and it's providing me access to COG files which are accessible to, to the server. Well, then I can use the uh, stack store to uh, connect to that stack API, to the external stack API, and use it to power a local image mosaic. So my Geo server would talk to the stack API figure out the assets that it needs, and then use the COG plugin to read them and generate images, composites. A bunch of documentation links for you to uh, investigate this topic more after the presentation. Okay, so those are where the basics of image mosaic. What can I do in terms of fun stuff? Well, as I said, uh, image mosaic indexes can be used for filtering, but not just for filtering, also for sorting, so that I can say something like, Make me a composite of all these uh, uh, assets and sort them by time, most recent on top. Or, no, wait, let's have uh, the most uh, cloudless image on top instead. So I could say something like, uh, take all the images in this area for the last week, composite them, put in the, the ones with the, the least clouds on top. Um, another in interesting thing is coverage views. So many data sources come with uh, bands which are se uh, separately stored, like Sentinel-2 typically has 13 files because not all files share the same resolution. We have 10, 20, and 60 meters of resolutions, so we have a, a set of 13 different files, but often you want to do composites or map, map algebra over a bunch of them, maybe at different resolutions. Coverage view allow you to take different bands coming from different files or within the same file, think about a NetCDF with a UMV component of the wind, and you can say, okay, now make me a virtual uh, raster that has bands coming from the various different sources. And then I can use it for RGB composites or for map algebra. Uh, this is a, another example exactly from the Sentinel-2 case. Those are a bunch of T files coming from Sentinel-2. I choose them all put them together as bands of a new virtual raster that uh, typically, uh, well, that is resampled on the fly on whatever resolution I choose. 
one of the three, the, the 10, the 20, or the 60. I have to decide on which one to, to uniform, and the other two will be resampled on the fly to allow to build composites. We have hyperspectral imagery support. At the beginning, it was uh, kind of hard because you know hyperspectral images can have hundreds, if not thousands, of, of bands. And we had to optimize GeoServer a little bit to uh, read efficiently for, uh, this, from this. Well, they are not file formats, because typically they are still GeoTIFFs, but they are organized per band rather than per pixel. And uh, well, um, at the beginning, we had to struggle a little bit, but now it's working fine. Again, a bunch of documentation links for you to follow uh, and uh, uh, drill down into this topic more. OK, so now how do I see these image mosaics? Well, uh, WMS. I can just point to the layer that is compositing through the mosaic all these images and have a look. We have WMS T as in time support. So the, the time associated to all these products is exposed through the capabilities and can be used to, to filter the, uh, the images and choose a particular time, either in WMS or in WMTS for the tiled services. Um, we have support for multiple dimensions at the same time if you need. So this is one example of uh, filtering over multiple dimensions uh, on uh, the, the last update of the file and uh, uh, another dimension at the same time. So it all turns into filters against the uh, index table. Uh, we have the ability to perform filtering. This is a vendor option. Adding SQL filter uh, equals to whatever, platform equals Sentinel-2, for example, or cloud cover greater, uh, sorry, less than 30%, or you know stuff like that. And uh, um, it all turns into filters against the uh, index table, which we use to look up the right images. And uh, we also have another vendor option in WMS, which is sort by which allows us to sort on whatever field we want, to have the cloudless on top or the most recent on top and so on. We have rendering transformations, uh, which are pretty useful. Uh, rendering transformations are this idea that I can run a, a quick, and, uh, quick uh, process on, on top of my data to turn it into something else, like uh, uh, on-the-fly isoline extraction, for example, in this, in this example or a generation of wind barbs from uh, uh, NetCDF files with a UMV component of the wind, or in this case, taking a multi-band uh, raster and calculating on the fly the NDVI index and then rendering the result as a map without ever storing the NDVI anywhere on disk. Again, a bunch of documentation links for you. OK, let's say that I found the data that I want. I prepared the composite that I like, what do I do about getting the raw data? Well, WCS is the OGC protocol for doing that. It's web coverage service. It's designed to download a subset of a large image mosaic uh, at, uh, in a particular bounding box, a particular resolution, with a particular band selection, eventually with a particular coordinate reference system with on-the-fly on the reprojection. Uh, the, the protocol can describe all the bits and pieces that make up a particular coverage. And uh, again, to match what you can do with WMS, we added vendor parameters to our WCS so that you can add on top of it filtering into the mosaic and sorting based on attributes. The idea is that you go uh, prepare the, the image that you would like to, to see on screen through the client, and then you can invoke WCS and download exactly what you are seeing as raw data, rather than as a pretty image. However, WCS is not always the right answer. Why? Because the WCS is a synchronous protocol. You make a request and you sit on that HTTP connection waiting for the data to come back, which is fine if you are trying to download uh, 100 megabytes of data. But if you are trying to download 20 gigabytes of data, that might take a long time, and the HTTP connection can go bye-bye and uh, leave you with nothing. So we need an asynchronous protocol to support a large download uh, capability. What's the protocol in uh, OGC that does asynchronous? WPS, Web Processing Service, which can be used for many things, not just analytics. So in, uh, in GeoServer, we created a, a process, a process called um, WPS Download that can uh, be used to perform large row download of data, both vector 
and raster. So you can point at your uh, complex large data source, indicate a large polygon that you would like to download at native resolution, and uh, um, send the request in an asynchronous way, poll the server to verify when the result is ready, and when it's ready, you get it. And that solves the issue of timeouts. Sometimes, what you want is not to download the raw data, but to download the processing or you know, the uh, rendering result, like the NDVI output, for example. We extended this download process so that you can also download large rendered map. Same principle. You can do a get map. It's normally fine. But if you are trying to download a, a, a map which is very large, you can stumble into time limits, uh, size limits, and so on. And the, the download might not be happening successfully. And so we have this asynchronous process that allows to download large rendered map. And so you, you, ask for, uh, you ask for your NDVI output on a very large area at maybe 2 meter resolution. The map might be 10 gigabytes worth of GeoTIFF rendered as an NDVI. Uh, if you do it asynchronous, that, asynchronously, that's not a problem. You just have to wait a little bit. Finally, um, since some, most of this data is time-based, it's interesting to perform animations on top of it and to see a time evolution of your, of your data. So this is, I think, Meteosat uh, over various uh, moments in time. Again, you can use the download animation process. Uh, it will execute all the get maps that it needs uh, to create the frames of the animation and then uh, composite it into an MP4 that you can then download sometime later. If you want to see all of, of this that I've been talking about in action, you can go to the UMETSAT uh, product viewer at that link. It's uh, open. You can uh, get into it. Um, it will allow you to uh, do time navigation. Um, the time navigation is powered by uh, another extension that we have in GeoServer, which we call WMTS Multidimensional. It's a protocol that allows you to uh, say, oh, can you tell me in this area what are all the single time steps that I have? And then we display them on the, on the, on the time slider. And you can drill in uh, or zoom out, uh, choose a particular date. And uh, you can see that there are multiple layers with uh, one clock uh, yellow. That means uh, that layer is actually driving the, the, time, uh, the time slider, and the others are adapting to it with nearest neighbor uh, matching, which is also something that we implemented recently in GeoServer, nearest neighbor uh, time uh, or dimension matching in general. Um, and uh, if you take the time to create your own uh, login for it, you can register to this site. It's also free then you can use the large row download and the large animation download uh, functionality as well. They are those two icons uh, here, the camera and, and the video camera. They allow you to do row downloads and, uh, or the download of what you're seeing and the download of an animation. And with this, I'm done. All right, uh, thank you for this interesting presentation. Now we have the chance to um, ask some questions. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks for the, for the talk. Uh, I have a question regarding the composite image. So when you are compositing multiple products into, into one larger mosaic, uh, does your process read all of the data or stops when the coverage is full? So do you check on that? Good question. So uh, by default, it would uh, load and composite all the images that match the current bounding box and filter. But we have one flag that can be enabled to perform uh, footprint uh, removal. And uh, in that case, once the rendering area is full with, uh, is already covered by, you know, the first images that we, we are rendering, then it stops. So uh, we, we call it uh, excess feature removal. And uh, for that to work, 
we need each image to have a footprint. So to know in advance, without having to open the, the whole raster, uh, what part of the raster is actually covered. And that could be an ROI, a binary mask in the file, or it could be a, a sidecar polygon as a vector. Yep, that's really important when you have deep uh, time uh, uh, availability. Because you, you need to stop after two, probably two, three times instead of trying to render 200 that you have in that, that area, yes. Thanks, Andrea. Uh, you were explaining about the stack API uh, remote stuff. Uh, is, can I compare that to a cascading service, or is it is it connecting on the fly to a remote stack catalog? Yes. Um, let me see if I can find again the, the slide. It was somewhere here. Yeah. So yeah, to some extent, it's like connecting to a remote WFS. Uh, except that uh, when we do remote WFS, what do we do then in output? We either transform it to WMS, because we are maybe rendering a map, or we expose another WMS. In this case, the stack store, it's like any other data store, so we can render the footprint uh, as a map, if we want, through WMS, and do whatever we normally do with, the, with WMS, because the store is really just like a shape file or a database and so on or we can use it to power an image mosaic. So those are the two intended use cases. Then if you want to expose that as OGC API features again, or WFS, you can do it as well. Do you have any uh Architecture recommendations in terms of orchestration or deployment. So, if you get a massive amount of data and you need uh, multiple view servers to uh, dice and slice and you know combine that later on and deliver that to the client. Mm, okay, so I, I don't have a good diagram for this, but uh, in terms of architecture, you need to have uh, probably some sort of hierarchical storage. Uh, for the images, especially if you have a very deep uh, uh, time sequence, maybe with uh, local fast storage for the images that you think are going to be used uh, the most, uh, and then progressively go towards cheaper and colder storage for the older images, um, and possibly make that transparent to GeoServer. Well, I mean, if you are using the Stack API and so on, it's just a matter of changing the links sometimes. Um, then, uh, then you need uh, an efficient database for, uh, to, to back the, the stack. We normally use PostgreSQL, but it could be done uh, with something else. We are just storing an index, so it's not a massive amount of data. Once you have a few ten millions of, of entries, you already have a, a very large raster catalog, but the database is still relatively small. And then for uh, the services, and mostly for the raster compositing, you need a relatively powerful machine uh, in terms of CPUs. That's kind of the one key mistake that people do when they deploy GeoServer. They go for the memory optimized machines. Don't do that. Go for the CPU optimized ones. You don't need that much memory. You, did, you need that much processing power. And then, uh, well, it's a matter of uh, you know scaling it up on a as, need basi as needed basis. So. Mm, uh, whatever elastic scaling mechanism is offered by your platform. Give or take, those are the, the basic indications. You. You're welcome. Okay. So um, then I would have one question. Do you see the new OGC um, APIs as a... Um, candidate for also sharing this EO data? So because currently we see WMS, WCS, do you th see some candidate uh, popping up in the horizon that is also capable of for this EO data? Of course. Uh, well, OGC APIs are basically doing the same job as the classic uh, OGC services. So it's the uh, same job done in a different way. Uh, GeoServer already has community modules for OGC API features, maps, tiles, coverages. They are at various stage of implementation. Features is already uh, site compliant. Uh, the others are sometimes incomplete, but they are there. You can uh, 
you can go and, uh, and use them. So for example, the, the DLR example that I was showing with the Stack API, this one, um, it's actually based on the same machinery as all the other OGC APIs and it's sharing quite a bit of code with OGC API features. So yeah, they, they are already there. You can use, it, use them now. DLR is uh, exposing a full set of OGC APIs through GeoServer this way. All right, that's interesting to hear. Okay, then uh, thanks again, Andrea. You're welcome.